These slides discuss alternative methods for species classification, including phonetics and cladistics. As you found with the ammonite classification exercise, traditional identification methods can be subjective, and phonetics and cladistics were developed as a more quantitative or objective approach for species classification. Like the traditional methods, phonetics is also a purely morphological method, but it incorporates quantitative measurements to discriminate between species. Uh, in particular, it uses data from morphometric studies to quantify shape differences among individuals. And morphometrics, in this case, simply refers to the use of measurements to describe aspects of shape. The simplest form of morphometrics involves bivariate plots, which graphically relate two measured parameters, for example, length and, and width in this simple case. In theory, spe specimens from species that differ in shape should fall along lines of different slope, with different intercepts, or with different trajectories in the case of, of trends that are not linear. Now, the example plotted here belongs to a trilobite species, uh, so the individuals group in these small clusters because trilobites periodically molt and grow a larger exoskeleton rather than growing continuously, and so you can see the clusters of molt stages or instars on this length versus width plot. A more sophisticated method called geometric morphometrics uh, quantifies shapes based on the position of many landmark points marked here on this, this trilobite cephalon. Ideally, a landmark should represent a homologous anatomical feature. Uh, homologous means that the feature has a shared evolutionary origin among the species under consideration. Uh, for example, the front of a trilobite glabella, 0.11, um, or the genal spine, uh, 0.9, um, are homologous features. Points can also be chosen to reflect geometric features, like positions of maximum curvature, uh, but that's less ideal than the homologous feature landmarks. The landmark points all have coordinates, x, y coordinates, and that multivariate data, the position of many x and y coordinates, can be summarized and assessed using ordination methods like you did with the species abundance data. Phonetics has advantages, uh, namely that it is a more quantitative approach and it should be more objective than traditional methods of classification. Um, however, it treats all morphological features equally and doesn't really distinguish between traits that are inherited from an ancestor and new evolutionary innovations found in a species. Uh, in addition, it can be misled by convergent evolution where similar morphologies evolve in unrelated groups and it doesn't specifically treat morphology in an evolutionary framework. The method of cladistics, or phylogenetic analysis, provides that explicitly evolutionary framework uh, based on shared anatomical characters to create hypotheses of evolutionary relationships. The result of this phylogenetic analysis is something called a cladogram, uh, which arranges taxa on branching trees. So the taxa are arranged at the branch tips, like this, with these seven taxa, um, and the branching points, or nodes, represent hypothetical common ancestors from which those species diverged. The first step in generating a cladogram is to code characters or morphological features, uh, typically dozens to more than a hundred features in an analysis. Um, these features are chosen and they're assigned discrete states such as the presence or absence of a particular feature. In the example illustrated here, the features are chosen for ammonite sutures, and they can be coded based on the orientation of specific lobes, whether they have no orientation or oriented one direction or, or the other. Um, so all these character states are coded, mostly a zero or one in the case of characters that have a presence or an absence, to produce a character matrix like is shown at the bottom here. So that character matrix is then crunched by a computer to determine the simplest branching tree that can be generated to minimize the number of character state changes. Now the principle that this uses is called parsimony, uh, the idea that it's more likely for features to evolve only once within these evolutionary lineages rather than evolving multiple times in unrelated groups. It's possible to create many different trees 
you know, some of which involve features evolving multiple times, but the idea is that the simplest one is perhaps the most likely to be at least close to the truth. truth. And keeping in mind these are all hypotheses of evolutionary relationships that can be tested with further taxa or with further characters in later studies. So the resulting cladogram can be used to assign species to larger groups, and these groups can be called monophyletic, paraphyletic, or polyphyletic, depending on how the taxa relate to their common ancestor. A monophyletic group, which is also called a clade, includes a single common ancestor and all of the species that descend from that ancestor. For example, uh, the species here in the, the red area um, comprise a monophyletic clade because that group includes a single common ancestor, the red node, and all of its descendants, all six branching tips that are found after that node or above that node on the tree. This blue group is also a clade, includes a single common ancestor at the blue node and all three of the descendants. And the same applies to this green clade. And this it can illustrate how more inclusive clades, like the small green clade, can nest within less inclusive clades, such as those Russian dolls that you, you may be familiar with. So monophyletic clades are the ideal classification method. We want to try and group species into larger groups that are actually monophyletic. But some traditionally uh, recognized groups, like crustaceans or fish, are actually what are called paraphyletic, because they include a common ancestor but only some of the descendants. Uh, for example, insects also develop from the same common ancestor as crustaceans, and we actually share a common ancestor with fish, but we are not traditionally considered fish, and insects are not traditionally considered to be crustaceans. So these groups are paraphyletic, which are also called grades as opposed to clades. And in this case, for example, the red group here does include a common ancestor of both of those species, but it excludes the six species at the top of the cladogram, which also arose from that common ancestor. This blue group is also paraphyletic because it includes only two of the three descendants of that common ancestor marked at the blue node. The third type of grouping is called polyphyletic. Now, polyphyletic group incorporates taxa that don't even share a unique common ancestor. For example, a group that includes the three taxa here highlighted in blue is polyphyletic because they don't derive from a single common ancestor. There are two common ancestors marked as the two blue circles at the nodes. And there are other taxa that branch from the cladogram between the common ancestor of all of the taxa marked. So because cladograms are based on shared characters, each branching node is defined by one or more character state changes. The change from a 0 to a 1 or a 1 to a 0 in our character matrix. The evolution of a new feature or the loss of a feature or the change in the nature of a particular anatomical characteristic. For example, this clade here, clade A, um, it can be defined by an evolutionary novelty or a derived character. And those are often marked by a box on the branch before the node like this. These evolutionary novelties are called apomorphies. And this particular trait is a synapomorphy, or a shared derived character, because it is shared by the common ancestor and all members of clade A, but is not found on the tree below where that box is marked. We can also consider taxon 1, one of the two taxa in clade A, and it can be distinguished from the other members of clade A by an evolutionary novelty as well, which we'll mark there. Because this novelty is unique to taxon 1 and not found in the other members, it's called an autapomorphy. So an autapomorphy and a synapomorphy are both subgroups of this broader apomorphy or evolutionary novelty, and it just matters whether they are unique to one taxon or shared among other many taxa. So members of a clade, like clade A, can also have traits that they inherited because those traits were present in an ancestor of the clade. So they are not a new evolutionary novelty evolved just in that clade. They had been present long before. These traits are called plesiomorphies that are primitive characters or ancestral traits. 
For example, plate B here is a less inclusive group. Uh, its members can be characterized by the possession of a particular synapomorphy marked down here. So this trait is a synapomorphy for clade B because it's an evolutionary novelty that first appeared in the common ancestor of all of the taxa in clade B, but was not present before. However, that trait is also a plesiomorphy for clade A um, because it's present only in clade A because those taxa, those two taxa in the red clade A, inherited it from their earlier ancestor. So in class, you'll practice making cladograms from data, frame, uh, data matrices, interpreting evolutionary relationships, and identifying monophyletic, paraphyletic, and polyphyletic groups, and finally also recognizing what apomorphies and plesiomorphies are on these phylogenetic trees.